I guess the thing I want to get across today in this world of shrinking media, shrinking conventional media, and clearly growing complexity and growing pace of change, growing population, growing consumptive impact and imprint on, on this earth, um, there, there will be new models and new innovations in the media. Um, this thing we call media basically is going to cease to exist, which we grew up with as kind of white guys with pads. Um, <laughs> Now it's becoming all of us. And I'm just going to take you around the web a little bit in a minute to show you that. And I think there's been a lot of resistance to that. The web is a two-pronged tool. It is both linking us globally right now and dividing us into little compartments and fragments. There's the, if you're a climate skeptic, you got your fragment, that's for sure. You know, you can go to, what's up with that? Is that W-A-T-T-S? What, what's that guy, Anthony Watts? You can go to his website and bathe yourself in reassuring findings. And if you're a climate calamitist, you know, someone who absolutely thinks the world is absolutely going, falling apart right now, and if we don't turn off all the smokestacks, we're going to die, you can go to plenty of websites as well and sort of have your comfort zone. Uh, one finding by the Pew Center for the Public and the Press, the, the Pew Research Center, that they do every January, a poll, and they look very carefully at people's attitudes on global warming. And they basically found that if you're, for example, if you're a Republican with a college degree, you are significantly, substantially more convinced that climate, human-caused climate disruption is a hoax than if you're a Republican, if, than if you're a Republican without a college degree. So more, more education makes, tends to make a Republican more doubting of the idea that humans can influence climate in dangerous ways. If you're a Democrat, it's precisely the inverse. More a college-educated Democrat is more convinced that the world is dangerously being warmed by, by greenhouse gases than a Democrat without a college degree. So th what that kind of says to me, it says a lot of things, and there's different interpretations, but to me it says once even a, a well-educated person tends to go out into the media environment and pick out the information that reinforces the existing silo. You're not going to change someone with new information, which for a journalist is really discouraging. I can't imagine how hard that must be for a scientist. <laughs> Don't you understand? We have all this evidence. <laughs> Here it is. Look. In the and middle of all that, you have this problem with the media going the opposite direction. Uh, we are forced ever more, com ever more desperately to find new, new, new means of telling stories, true stories ideally, to the public by whatever means. We're migrating steadily and ever more rapidly in a non-linear way from print pages to the web. And the web itself is evolving even as that's happening. So the web itself is kind of got all these elements that weren't there a couple of years ago. Now, before I kind of go over time, I do want to show you around the web a little bit as a way to show you the potential. I'm going to focus on the potential for it to do the good thing, to link everybody, to spread information in useful ways. Uh, if you haven't seen Dot Earth, I created this 14 months ago as a subversive way to get one of the ultimate incremental stories into a, a newspaper that demands things that, to be important and news. When I came, went to the North Pole in 2003, all that I put on the website was still images and dispatches while I was writing my print stories. That was 2003. 2004, when I went to Greenland, I started, we did a blog, sort of. It didn't have interactivity. You couldn't post comments if you were a reader. But it was these mini dispatches so like every couple of hours with a fresh photograph. And then there was video um, that we did in little snippets, little bite-sized pieces to try to explain some of the, fa the complexities and, and trends in Greenland. And now, I, and I'm on Facebook, and I'm on Twitter, and I don't even, you know, I barely understand them. Even David Pogue, I, as reading today's paper, barely understands them, which is encouraging to me. Um, <laughs> means I'm not that far behind the curve. Um, but I think if we're not, if we are not, and I mean, I don't just mean journalists, I think in, increasingly if scientists are not thinking more creatively about how to convey their, their story, and, and I, I emphasize the word story because then we're in trouble. And the reason I emphasize the word story, I think, as I'm sure many of you run up against, whether you're talking to kids or whatever, there is still a very persistent perception, uh, despite all the work of Darwin and, and everybody else over these, this hundred century or two, that science is a set of facts that are just sitting waiting to be kind of unveiled. In fact, what is the most powerful thing about science is the trajectory of understanding. And when people understand that there's the trajectory is driven by argument, constructive, and, but sometimes loud, <laughs> argument. 
And, but they, then they don't sort of shy away and say, oh, they're arguing, therefore we don't know anything about sea ice, therefore I can go back to worrying about my 401k. Um, bottom line is I think every scientist working on the federal dime should be obligated to spend some of the time not just writing the piece for the paper, for the, the paper for the journal, but figuring out ways to convey the, the work to the wider public. Uh, Jane Lipchenko was an advisor to Google Earth when I just wrote about this two weeks ago. They've just added all these elements to Google Earth, including that, that thing called the ocean that they had forgotten. <laughs> they literally forgot the oceans. And she sh uh, Sylvia Earle shamed uh, this Google Earth designer into adding the oceans, that two-thirds of the world that they forgot. Um, now, if you go to, go to the story, go on Dot .earth and put in uh, ocean, and you'll see Google Ocean now allows, if you're doing a project, if Boris or somebody is doing something on, on sharks in the Philippines, you can put photos, video, and all that stuff in a little geotagged uh, narrated tour. You can create your own little narrated, this is my project, I'm, this is what I'm doing. Even if you're in Boulder, you know, doing, working on a supercomputer, you can do that. And it's there as a clickable element in a certain layer on Google Earth for every kid in the world who has access to the internet or every grandparent to kind of click on and get some little sense of what's going on um, in that big blue part of the, the planet. Or in, it's not just the blue part, it's the whole part. The other element that I think sometimes is lacking, and this dates back to an interview I did with Ed Wilson like almost 20 years ago about rainforests. And, and this relates to what's been discussed here about ecosystem services lately and I've written about this a little bit. There, I think a lot of scientists get very frustrated that you know they don't get it, they don't get it, they don't get it. What can we do to make them get it better? Maybe if they don't value rainforests because they're cool, maybe if we've proved to them that there's monetary and economic value, then they'll act to conserve things. And I, there may be some truth to that, I'm not sure, but uh, like 20 years ago, Ed Wilson, uh, we were talking about rainforests, and he, he took down the, the sort of the classic list of why we should care about rainforests. It's the the, the, the the drug cabinet of the world, it's the uh, you know, great part of the climate system, it's this, that, and the other. And then the last thing, and then I said, well, what, Ed, what is the thing about rainforests that you, you wake up you know, wanting to think about and do? He said, I, said, I just love them. I love, I love how they look, I love how they smell. You know, I love breaking open a log and spending the whole day digging in. And, and that element, the values thing, is such a vital and missing part of our discourse. I mean, it's a very much, traditionally missing in journalism, at least traditional sort of cut and dry journalism. It's missing in uh, most scientific papers. <laughs> um, it's missing in a lot of environmental campaigns. Many environmental campaigners, when they look at the North Slope uh, question, they focus on ecosystem integrity and the caribou, you know, they're not gonna breed if the pipelines are there. And then suddenly the pipelines are there and the caribou are still breeding. So it kind of takes away that argument. Instead of saying it's just wrong to have pipelines in a, a national wildlife refuge, the values arguments are rarely the ones that are pushed hardest, maybe because in our political system that kind of gets you in dangerous places, I don't know. So I'm, to illustrate the value of values, I'm gonna show you one or two one minute clips, and I think I have about five minutes left, so that should work. This one I assembled from various fragments. Let me just set it up for you a little bit. So, for, you know, just in December was the 40th anniversary of the Earth's Rise photograph, that, that snapshot taken. No one had planned that that was a significant part of the Apollo 8 mission. Um, so recently, I, I, I had the snapshot, of course. Uh, last year, uh, no, in 2007, Japan had a satellite orbiting the moon, and that took a video version of the Earth Rise photo, but it was this video thing that you'll see in a second that I had not seen. I'm like, how could I not have seen this? Maybe it was, maybe someone has seen it. And then uh, Andy Chaikin, who wrote the definitive history of the Apollo program, sent me an MP3 file of the conversation the astronauts had at the moment when they saw the, the Earth. And I just, in five minutes on my, with iMovie, I just did this one minute thing. It's not even one minute. I don't know how, you know, obviously that doesn't relate to every single piece of science that's done by everyone in the room. Um, but if there aren't ways to um, address those elements of the question of how we head toward 9 billion people with the fewest regrets, if, if those elements aren't included in the discourse, then we're probably going to sort of get off track a little bit. Um, so I'll stop there. Thank you.